Stand with me, will you please, as we're reading from God's Word from 1 Corinthians 15. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and in which you stand, by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Father, we thank you for this reminder, this tutorial in the gospel. We pray that once again this morning you will open it, open it, our hearts to it, help us to understand it, perhaps even more than we ever have before. But especially, Father, that you would be more precious to us. We would understand better exactly what you have accomplished on our behalf. Thank you so much for that. Father, we pray for those who are not able to be here today because they are sick or because they are traveling uh, different, many different reasons. We pray that you will protect them and keep them. Um, Father, we pray for those who are not here but should be here today. And we ask that you will bring conviction and that you will cause them to see that they need to be with other believers. They need to be around those who know you so that we can do what your word says, stir each other up to love and good works. And that's exactly what we desire to do on behalf of the Savior who has saved us. We pray for those who are, uh, Father, representing us in far places. Uh, we continue to remember Daniel Losey. We pray that you will continue to raise him up, this, this young man, and we pray that his family will be able to, to continue the ministry that they've had in this faraway place in the Middle East. But while they're here with this heart transplant for little Daniel, we pray that you will help them to still be effective Pray that you'll provide for the visas that they are going to need. Pray for all the needs that they have. Father, we pray for uh, our missionaries in uh, uh, places like uh, Preston Ranch, which is not that far away, but for Bob and Ellen as they provide homes for, for foster children. And uh, Lord, the great work that you've given them there, we pray that you will Bless them. Be with Ellen as she comes and ministers here in the near future. And uh, we pray that uh, uh, some of our ladies who can will go and uh, hear her and understand more what you are doing. Lord, you give us wonderful privileges around the world. We want to take advantage of each one because we want people to know you. Lord, you are precious to us and we thank you for being here this morning. Cause us not to go the same as we came because your, your word has been ministered to us by your spirit. We pray that for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated, and uh, please turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15, if you have not already. I apologize. For those of you who have the, you know, the outline books, at the beginning of the quarter, I didn't know what I was going to do here, that there would be three sermons instead of one for Easter, and so I know your outline doesn't match Use the one in the bulletin uh, as the best I can recommend and uh, sometimes the best laid plans. Think of it this way, you're a little ahead going into April and uh, so we'll catch you up then. But 1 Corinthians 15 is this wonderful passage where Paul is reminding them of the gospel, the gospel, literally good news. He's reminding them of the good news, but it is the good news that has been so abused and twisted and made to mean things that it doesn't really mean in so many cases in our day, and the same thing was happening in first century Corinth. There, the main problem was that many were claiming that the resurrection of Christ was not really just a physical resurrection, just a spiritual resurrection of some kind. So the text is saying, it's time to get back to basics. It's time to review the gospel, to re-understand, if that's what we need to do, what the good news is really about. And so in these few verses, Paul gives us the gospel, probably 
the briefest, the most succinct, and yet most powerful manner in which it's given in Scripture. We started to look at it last week. The gospel provided, verses 3 and 4. Verses 1 and 2 that we'll look at today, the gospel possessed. And then on Easter Sunday, the gospel proven, verses 5 through 8. It's one of the great passages in all the Bible. The whole of 1 Corinthians 15 is. Uh, if you don't have anything to do this week, read it, and reread it, and read it again. You will be blessed by that wonderful passage of Scripture. Well, the gospel, as we saw last week, is provided by God alone. He didn't need any help. In fact, he couldn't have any help. There was nothing that we could do to provide for our own salvation. The only news in our lives prior to salvation, prior to God doing what he did, was bad news. It is that we are, without him, lost. That we are, that we are from the inside out, selfish people who want our own way, who need to be changed from the inside. And so the gospel, where he tells us that Christ has come and was died and was buried to pay for the sins that we could not pay for it. That is good news, beloved. That's good news. He paid the price that I can't pay. God's standard of perfection is something I could never meet on my own. And so God meets his own demands on my behalf. Can you get better news than that? You know, we can't do away with the holiness of God with the justice of God. It's part of the love of God, frankly, that he's going to make an end to sin one of these days. He's going to make an end to judgment, but we would all be part of the end. We're not for the fact that he's provided for salvation. And so this wonderful God has met his own demands on my behalf. The price has been paid. The ransom has been made. The provision is there. The gift has been promised. That's the gospel provided. The problem is that doesn't make it mine, right? That doesn't make it mine yet. When you look at the Christmas tree on Christmas morning and you get up and there's the package all wrapped, it's nice and neat and beautiful, and it's there and it's got your name on it. But until you unwrap it and until you accept it, it is not yours, right? And it's the same with the gospel. It must, now that it's provided, be unwrapped and accepted. And that's what Paul talks about in verses 1 and 2, how that happened for these people. Now, I think we have to understand going into this, beloved, the Bible is very clear about one thing. I would never knew, do this on my own. My own self is so broken. That's how broken I am. I would never willingly come to God. I might say that I'm coming to God. I might say I'm a searcher, but what I'm really seeking is a God of my own making, a God who will excuse me. Jesus knew that. That's why Jesus says in John 6, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him or her. We do not, of our own volition, without any prompting from the Holy Spirit, would never turn to God. The Bible is very clear that no one seeks after God. No one truly wants Him because we fear Him. But we can come by faith that is not of our own doing, according to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. I will give you the faith, God says. If you are a believer today, it's not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. So we have to understand that to start with. It's God's work, not only providing it, but even helping us possess it. And yet with that truth kind of identified as a biblical truth, there is another sense in which the, uh, underneath the umbrella of God's sovereignty, there is my responsibility. Bible teaches both. And so it teaches that, that, that what God has provided, I must somehow reach out and receive John 1.12 says to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, those are the ones to whom he gave the power or the right or the authority to become the children of God. And Paul uses the same word receive 
here in this passage when he says, the gospel which I preached to you, which you received. So I have to understand that what God has provided, I must reach out and accept if I am to possess it. I do that by faith. I do that by believing that God will honor his word and that if I will come and repent and confess my sins and ask for his forgiveness, he will indeed provide that. But I must do that. Jimmy Kimmel, that great theologian, once said, you should never be late in London. He said, because they have a big clock there. It's right in the middle of town. And of course, he's right. Big Ben is there. Some of you have seen it. But the only way that clock is a benefit to you is if you look at it, right? It's not going to help you one bit if you don't look at it. I realize it dings on the hour, but basically you have to look at it, right? And you know what? The Bible speaks of salvation in exactly those same terms. The Lord says in Isaiah 42, look to me and be saved all you ends of the earth. Look to me. That was the, that was the, that was the verse that prompted the salvation of the great London preacher Charles Spurgeon when he was 15 years old. He came into a church service one day when the regular pastor was absent and a layman had been asked at the last minute to get up and preach because there was a great snowstorm coming up and this guy didn't know what else to do, but he just got up and he quoted Isaiah 45, 22 and he said, look to me. And then he looked straight at Spurgeon and he said, young man, look to Christ. Spurgeon often talked about that salvation because he realized in that moment there was nothing he could do. He'd been trying to work his way and trying to figure out what could he do to get right with God. And now he saw it. All I can do is look to him. Look to Christ. So we must look to Christ for salvation provided to become salvation possessed. But in this passage of Scripture, it really kind of shows us the human path to that, kind of three phases of a human path to come to faith, to possess the salvation, to possess the gospel that God has so richly provided. And so let's look at those steps as they're listed here. What's the first step? Preaching. Preaching. The gospel must be preached. Think of it this way. Good news is not good news if you don't know the good news, right? Your Uncle Joe, living in New York State, you know, dies and he leaves you $10 million. Well, that's wonderful. It's good news. But it's not good news until you hear about it, right? It's not good news if somebody doesn't tell you. You'd never know that you had this. It's meaningless to you until you know it. And that's Paul's point when he says there in verse 1, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached to you. It's actually an inter interesting phrase that he uses there. He says, the gospel that I gospeled to you literally. He, he, he uses a verb form of the noun. Here's the gospel and I gospeled it to you. Here's the good news and I good newsed you. It wasn't good news to the Corinthians until someone told them, somebody, Paul, he came along and he gospeled them. Have you, have you gospeled anybody lately? Have you, have you good news to anybody? I mean, really good news. I mean, it's great news that the Broncos won the Super Bowl, right? But I mean, really good news. I mean, permanent good news. Have we gospeled anybody? People can't possess it if they don't hear it. And so we have a responsibility to preach it, to proclaim it, to let people know it, to share it. How do you do that? Yeah, yeah. You know, we, we make this so complicated sometimes. When was the last time you just asked somebody, what do you think of Christ? They'll tell you what they think of Christ. Maybe good, maybe bad, doesn't really matter. What do you think of Christ? Because you know what, sooner or later, they're gonna ask you, well, what do you think of Christ? See? And when they ask you that, what do you say? Well, I think Christ died for our sins, that he was buried and that he rose again. I think Christ did that for us. You know what, when you've done that, you just shared the gospel. 
It doesn't have to be more complex than that. And when you do that, you give somebody else the opportunity. They can accept it. They can reject it. Or in most, most likely, if it comes in that small of a way, they're going to want to question it more. But that's okay. You've gospeled somebody. We're here to gospel people. Certainly preachers need to preach it, right? Preachers need to preach it. But you know what? Well-intentioned people are telling us that preaching is out these days. People won't, they can't take it. They, you know, we, we have such short attention spans because we're victims of our, of our soundbite age. And so, you, you know, we can't listen to a whole so 10, 15 minutes. I mean, Max, that's, that's about it. That's about the best you can do. Although I notice, I do notice that people don't have any problem watching one-hour television shows two-hour movies, three-hour football games. No problem with those. We kid ourselves, beloved. The experts have decided people must be entertained. They've decided that the sermon should be a dialogue. They've decided that the gospel should be transformed into a debate or a bargaining session. You know, fix my problems, Lord. Fix, just, just fix my problems and, I, and, I'll, and I'll follow you as long as you don't send me to Africa or South America or ask me to do something, you know, difficult. That's not the gospel. That's a, that's a, that's a negotiation. The gospel is not a negotiation. It's a statement of truth that I either accept or reject. The gospel is a statement of truth. It needs to be preached, not debated. That's why Paul says in, in Romans 1.15, he says, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. He had good news to preach. He didn't have a philosophy to debate or a religion to impose. He just had a truth to bring. He had a good news message to bring. What they did with it would be up to them, but he had a good news message to bring. That's our job. It's just like your Uncle Joe who's left you the $10 million, right? The word finally gets to you. The lawyer calls you on the phone. He says, hey, guess what? Your Uncle Joe died. Oh, that's too bad. But he left you $10 million. That's great, right? Good old Uncle Joe. $10 million. Now you have the message, right? And you can do, what can you do with it? Well, number one, you can say, I don't believe that. Uncle Joe didn't have 10 million. I don't believe that. And you can ignore it, which, which would be rather absurd if he really did have $10 million that he left to you, right? But you could ignore it. You could reject it. You could believe it's true, but decide, I don't, what would I do with $10 million? So I'm looking around this morning. I don't think any of you would do that, right? Somebody left me $10 million, I think I could find something to do with it. But you could believe it and reject it, right? Or you could believe it and accept it. I mean, that's what you do with the gospel. It's good news. News is not a negotiation. News is a statement of truth that you either accept or reject. Paul emphasizes this in Romans 10. If you're in 1 uh, Corinthians, just turn back few pages. It's Romans 10. It's one of the great passages about the gospel. Romans 10, beginning in verse 14. Paul says, how then will they hear a call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? That's a good question, isn't it? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Notice he doesn't say without someone debating, without somebody coming and having a dialogue here. He's saying, no, they, you, you, you proclaim good news. The logic is irrefutable. He concludes in verse 17. He says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Preaching, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 21. Some of you remember this passage. He says there, preaching is, is it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who will believe. You say, well, yeah, but shouldn't, shouldn't we be prepared to defend it a little more than that, you know, to, to tell why we accept this good news? Absolutely. 
What, is, what does Peter remind us? First Peter 3.15, he says, always being prepared to make a defense, right? For anyone who asks you the reason for the hope that's in you, sure. The further along you get, the more mature you get, the more you should be understanding why I believe this word, why I believe this is the word of God, why I believe this is good news. But just start with the core of it. You'll never have, if you're waiting for all the answers, you, you'll wait a long time. I don't have all the answers. I'm pretty sure you don't have all the answers, but the Lord isn't asking us to have all the answers. He's asking us to proclaim the good news. Listen to this. This is, this is believe it or not, this is, this is from network television. This was on an episode of ER. And I, I'm going to kind of read this dialogue in total. So hang on. Think of it as a TV show. If you've you got to close your eyes and look, I mean, do that, whatever. But here's, here's a retired police officer, retired, retired police officer, he's die, dying of cancer, and he's absolutely ridden with guilt. Because he framed an innocent man at one point. He didn't know the guy was innocent. He thought he was absolutely guilty. But he framed him and the man got executed. And so now, now he's about to die of cancer at a, at a younger age than he ever expected. And, and he's lying on his hospital bed. And here's what he says. He says, how can I even hope for forgiveness? Hospital chaplain is there and he replies, well, I think often it's easier to feel guilty than forgiven. The cop says, which means what? I'm dying here. What does God want of me? The chaplain replies, I think it's up to each one of us to interpret for ourselves what God wants. The man is amazed. He says, so people can do anything? They can rape, they can murder, they can steal all in the name of God and because they think it's okay, it's okay. The chaplain says, that's not what I'm saying. And he says, then what are you saying? Because all I'm hearing here is new age, God is love, have it your own way, crap. I don't have time for this now. The chaplain says, you don't understand. He says, Cop says, no, you don't understand. I want a real chaplain who believes in a real God and a real hell. Chaplain replies, I, I hear that you're frustrated, but you need to ask yourself. And the man says, no, I don't need to ask myself anything. I need answers. And all your answers and all your uncertainty are only making things worse. Chaplain tries once more. I know you're upset. He says, God, I need someone who will look me in the eye and tell me how to find forgiveness because I am running out of time. Now listen, beloved. Don't wait till your deathbed to figure out that you're running out of time. And friends and loved ones that are around us that don't know the Lord, don't let them get to their deathbed and they're running out of time and the only answer they're getting is an opinion, a dialogue, a philosophy. You won't cut it when you're dying. I promise you that. 21st century people need the same thing that 1st century people did. They have the same problem. They need a savior We've convinced ourselves because we deny sin. We deny the reality of what God says is true of every person. And when we deny that, we say, well, what people need is a psychiatrist. They need a psychologist. They need a counselor. They need an advice guru. They need somebody that will help them feel good. And what they need is a savior. What they need is the gospel. They need good news, not good advice. And how do they get it? By the preaching of the word. By proclaiming it. All of us can share the good news. Jesus died for your sins. How difficult is that? He was buried and he rose again. Go from there. Somebody says, I don't believe all of that. Well, let me give you some things to think about. But it's our job to make it known. 
I don't think, I hope this is true. If you've been at our church any time at all, I don't think you'll be able to say, I never heard it. Let's make sure that our friends and neighbors and loved ones and people that we know will never be able to say, I never heard it. The gospel is first of all proclaimed. We have the same commission Paul did when he said in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 16, he said, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Our job is not to argue people into the kingdom. It's not. Our job is to share good news. So we need to preach it, share it, proclaim it, whatever it takes to get it out there. It must be preached. Secondly, good news must be then possessed. It must be possessed. So we've heard the gospel, now what? Back to verse one again. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received. I preached it, you received it, so you're saved. But what does it mean to receive the gospel? What does that mean? Well, the word that Paul uses here is a general word that's often used just to mean take or to receive, either one. <coughs> Excuse me, for example. He uses it in Matthew 17, 1, when he talks about how Jesus took Peter and James and John up on the mountain of transfiguration with him. It means it's a transfer from one place to another. But when used to speak of receiving the gospel or receiving Christ, it means to make a commitment. It means to move from a direction that is self-centered to a direction that is now Christ-centered, that is God-centered. That is to receive. John 1.11 again said, Concerning Christ, he came into his own and his own people did not, did not receive him. So what happened? They didn't receive him. Were they lacking facts? Did they not know who they were looking at? I don't think that was the problem. They'd seen and they had heard the good news. So how did they not receive him? Well, the next verse, verse 12 that we referenced earlier. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, literally believed into his name. To receive Christ means to believe into his name. It means to believe who he is as the God-man, and it means to accept what he has done in dying to pay the price for my sins. I don't just believe the facts about him. I believe what he has done, and I make a commitment to him. It's not about knowing the facts. It's about committing to the facts. It's about committing to a person. That's what the Corinthians did. Paul preached. They received. They said, this is true. I can stake my life on this, and that's what I'm going to do. Paul preached. They received. It's like, it's like getting married. It's like getting married. The word is even used that way. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, you can look this up when you get home, but the angel comes and tells Joseph, hey, don't fear to take, don't fear to take, and that's our word, don't fear to take Mary as your wife. Marriage relationship. For that which is conceived in her is by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Joseph was worried about that. Jesus says, no, no, take her. Marry her. That's what we do when we believe into the name of Jesus Christ, we're now married. When you say, I do, things are not the same anymore, right? They're not. You say, I do, and you go to a different home that night. You have different priorities all of a sudden. The things that you're thinking about buying and the things that you're thinking about doing and all of the things that are around you, they all change overnight, right? You're a, you're a different person than you were before you got married. You said, I do. You committed. That's what it means to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. It means to allow him to come into our life. John 17 verse 3 says what? This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. No. Receivers have said, I do, and they're now part of the 
bride of Christ, to receive the message of the gospel is to transfer allegiance from me to him. Ray Pritchard is a pastor. He tells of a tough cop who lived across the street from him in Southern California at one time. Jaded veteran from Vietnam that had been a cop for many years. He'd seen probably too much of the underside of life, which often happens. They began to talk, shared the gospel. The guy had question after question after question. I'm sure that Ray Pritchard sometimes had to say, I don't know, I'm not sure, I'll go find out. But the questions came and the answers came over time. Until one day they went out for lunch and the guy said, look, I want to tell you what happened to me. He said, as I was reading the Bible one day, suddenly it hit me, this stuff is true. I received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. felt like a thousand pounds had been lifted from my shoulders. What was the thousand pounds? It was the guilt of the sin and selfishness that's a part of every life, even the best life that there is. We have to receive, say I do, to the Savior who has died for us. So it has to be possessed. What's the third thing about the gospel? It must be preached, must be possessed, it must be persevered in, persevered in. Verse one again of our passage. I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preached to you. Now, if you're tracking with me, a couple questions ought to arise in your mind as I'm reading that passage. First, Paul seems to imply that we are saved if we hold fast to the gospel. It almost sounds like salvation by works, right? And then secondly, he says, we are being saved. Not we're saved, but we are being saved. That's an ongoing action. I thought when I trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior, I was saved once for all. So what is this continuous reference? Those are great questions. Let's regroup. See if we can answer them. First of all, I think we need to understand that salvation is a thing that happens at a moment in time when I reach out by faith to Jesus Christ and my heart truly changes from an orientation toward sin and self and me to an orientation toward him. That happens at some moment in time in our lives. And the Bible makes that clear in passage after passage after passage. Let me give you two. Ephesians 2.8. For by grace you have been saved by faith. Past tense. It's happened. Ephesians 2.8. And then what did Jesus tell Nicodemus in John 3, verse 3? He told him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Born again. It's an aorist verb, a Greek aorist, which means a point in time action. You are born again at a point in time if you're going to see the kingdom of God. The analogy there is absolutely perfect. It's why I've chosen that passage, because when you are born physically, you're born, right? You're not being born the rest of your life. You're here. And it's the same with our spiritual birth. When we are born spiritually, we are born again. And we are there spiritually at that point in time. But just as in the physical life, you are born once, but you go on living physically. So when we are born spiritually, we are born and we go on living spiritually. By an act of the Holy Spirit, we have repented of our sins. We have given ourselves un unreservedly toward him. But Paul is emphasizing another nuance of our salvation here in 1 Corinthians 15. It's a beautiful thing that he's showing us. So let's go back in verse 1 and read this again very carefully. Now a little bit of grammar. Sorry about that, but it helps. He says, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I 
preached, aorist tense, past action, point in time action in the past. I preached to you, which you received, point in time action, aorist tense, past tense, you received it. You're good to go because you received it. But Paul doesn't leave it there. See, he goes on and he says, in which you stand. And the word stand is a perfect tense, meaning a past action that has a continuous, a continuous result in the, in, the, in the ongoing present and into the future. You stand, meaning you stood on the gospel at that point in time, but now you're continuing to stand on the gospel. You're continuing to believe what you said you believed. You're showing the signs of commitment in your life. You're continuing to stand. And then he says, if, if you hold fast the word I preach to you. And there we need to understand the Greek language has four ways to say if. In English, we only have one way. We say if, and it means maybe, maybe not. In Greek, they have four ways to say it. And the way that he says it here is the one that is the absolute most definitive. It's, the, it's a first class if condition, which means I assume this to be true. We could translate this legitimately since. Since you hold fast to the word I preached to you, you are being saved. That's a present tense word meaning Continuous action, translated, you are being saved is the, is the right way to translate it. Now, a quick, very quick lesson about salvation, and then we'll come back and read that verse with those things in mind. Salvation is really comprised of more than one thing. Justification is the past act by which I am brought to faith in Christ, and I am, I am declared by God to be righteous, even though I'm certainly not yet at that point in time, but because of the blood of Christ, I'm declared to be righteous, justified. Sanctification is the process by which I am continually made by God to become what, in, in, in practice, what I am in position. Not completely sanctified yet. But God is sanctifying those who are being saved. That's what the word really means, are being sanctified. They're, they're in the middle of this process now of coming to a point of perfection that will only happen in the day of Christ. Then there's a third element of salvation, which is called glorification. Glorification is the day that I will stand perfect before God. No more sin in my life. No more need for forgiveness because it's all happened now and God has glorified me. He's, he's removed me from this body and he's given me a glorious new body like his glorious body according to Philippians 3.20 and I am now glorified. So what he's talking about here is that second aspect of salvation. He's saying, look, I preached it to you. You received it. You became a believer at that point in time, but you are continually being saved. You are continually kind of held up every day of your life by the Lord. You continue to sin, but he continues to save you because you're holding fast to the word. And you're doing that because you're real. Now, there's a lot of people who come and make a claim of faith who do not hold fast. It's because they never really held fast to begin with. They were never real. But for those who are real, this is what you do. This is how you act. His basic message here is that if you are truly a believer, you will persevere in your faith. You will continue in your faith. If it was real. When it started, it will continue to be real through your life. Doesn't mean that there might be, might not, that, that there won't be failure. There will be failure. In some cases, there may be mon monumental failure for some period of time. But a true believer will have generally a, generally a lifestyle that is becoming more and more and more Christ-like as we go along. You cannot become a, a believer and this not happen, beloved. The Bible describes it this way in another place. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says that as we come to faith in Christ, we have been made a new creation. We're a new creation in Christ. Now, here's the issue. The new creation that's spiritual, that you can't see, taste, touch, feel, or anything else, but it's there. It's inside you because that's the way God made you. Now wars with the old you, which isn't gone yet. Well, you're in this body there's the old you, and now there's the new you. There's the new creation and the old creation, and they war against each other. It's no wonder that a believer has the war going on, but the point is you do have a war going on. 
If you can sin and it doesn't matter, you're probably not a Christian. If you can easily do the things that you did before, you're probably not a Christian because when you become a believer, your life has to change. Genuine change is one of the marks of a true believer. You know, last week, I, I was really privileged to meet with our young people. And they had a bunch of questions that we went over. And one of the questions, how do you know that you're really saved? How do you know that you're really a believer? And there are a lot of ways, frankly, in Scripture, a lot of way, places we could go to talk about that. One of the ones I like best is in, in Romans 8.16. Romans 8, 16, the Bible says the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So one of the ways we know that we're saved is that there's the Spirit of God literally is inside of us telling us you're saved, you're saved, you're saved, you're saved. <laughs> Satan comes along and says, oh, I doubt it. Look what you just did. You're not a Christian. But the Spirit is saying, no, you are. You're covered by the blood of Christ. You accepted him. Remember that? You're a Christian. That that witness will be there. You can't shut down the Holy Spirit any more than, you know, than, you, can, than you can shut down the, the water faucet when you turn it on. The Holy Spirit is there. And he will bear witness. But here's another way that you can tell that you're truly a believer, that you really belong to Christ. You're not the same person you used to be. You're not. You're a changed person. What did Jesus say in the Gospels? He said, by, your, by their fruit, you shall know them. What was, he, what was he saying? He was saying that those who are true believers will exhibit that in the way they live. The new life will exhibit more and more and more Christ-like attitudes and actions. If you don't see that change in your life, if there's no orientation to love the things of God, if there's no inclination to want to be around the people of God, if there's no wanting to stand firm in the gospel which you have said you committed to, if there's no desire for the change of life that comes with those who are truly Christian, if you don't see anything different in your life, if your desires and your habits and all the things that surround you are not different, the things you want to look at, the things you want to see, the things you want to hear, the things that you see as most important in life, if that hasn't changed, probably not a Christian. Because those who are saved will be standing in those things and holding fast to what they have committed to so that they are being saved as they go along. This is what he's talking about. We will want to obey the commands of our new owner. Now listen, let me hasten to add again, this is not, we're not teaching here that you will become per perfect in this life. Paul says in Philippians 1, 3, 1, 6, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion, or the word could be translated perfection, when? At the day of Jesus Christ. Not today, not tomorrow, not the next day, but at the day of Jesus Christ. When is that? Well, that's either when you die and go meet him or when he comes back to collect you because of his second coming, whichever comes First, then you will be perfect. In the meantime, he is gradually moving us in that direction as we battle daily with the old flesh, the new us battling with the old flesh. But we are moving upward. The signs of spiritual life are there. We are not real. Sometimes the price is higher than others. was illustrated in the book called The Robe, Lloyd Douglas book. Some of you may have read it a few years ago, 40 or 50 years ago. It was popular, but it was about Marcellus, the centurion, supposedly who was there when Jesus was crucified. It's a, it's a fictional book, but he wins Jesus' robe in the throw of the dice there, right? And so he gets that, but he, that gets him really interested in Jesus, who, who really is this guy? You may remember that in Luke, it tells us that that centurion looked at Jesus as he was dying on the cross and said, this truly, this man was innocent. And so the book picks up from there and it kind of makes a fictional account of him 
following the footsteps of Jesus, going all the places Jesus went, running into Jesus' disciples eventually, becoming eventually a believer himself. And so he writes back to Rome and he informs his fiancee, Diana, that he has become a Christian. And she writes him back. And she says this, she said, I feared that your faith might somehow affect your life and mine too. It's a beautiful story, Marcellus, a beautiful mystery. Let it remain so. We don't have to understand it and we don't have to do anything about it, do we? But Marcellus knew, yes, I do have to do something about it. If it's real, we will know that. Our life will change. For these two people, it did change. They, by the end of the time they give their life, both of them as husband and wife, executed for the name of Jesus Christ. People all over our world today, beloved, are being executed for the name of Jesus Christ. This is not fairy tales, and it's not, you know, like camp meeting time where we have a lot of fun, and we go to church, and then we go home, and that's the end of it. If that's the end of it, it isn't real. It isn't. It can't be. If Jesus really lives inside, there has to be a change. We will be standing in that which we have committed to. Otherwise, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, it will be proven vain in our life, meaning we made a commitment that wasn't real at all. Just going through the motions. Wanted to please somebody. Didn't really mean it. You know what Jesus says in, Re in Revelation 3.5? Here's what he says. He says the one who conquers, or the word could be translated perseveres. Some of your Bibles will say overcomes. It really means perseveres. The one who perseveres will be clothed thus in white garments and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Who is that? The one who perseveres. Why? Because of his works? Because he's so good? Because he doesn't know? Because his perseverance proves that his commitment was real. Because his faithfulness to, a husband's faithfulness to his wife proves what? That his commitment was real. That's the way it is with Christ. So the gospel provided is all by God. Jesus died, was buried, rose again. Provided the basis for our coming to faith in Christ. That's the good news. The good news possessed comes to me when I hear it preached, when my heart responds and I reach out and receive it and take it as mine, accept it as the gift that God intends it to be, and then demonstrate that by persevering in that life as I go forward. One man had gotten a new pacemaker. His daughter came over. He was showing her the paperwork, all excited. He said, look at this, look at this. Look at this information sheet. Look, this, this thing has a lifetime guarantee. <laughs> You'd like to think so if you got a pacemaker, right? It has a lifetime guarantee. Pretty sure it will have a lifetime guarantee. Listen, beloved, the good news is from Jesus Christ, there is salvation available to us. And it doesn't come with just a lifetime guarantee. It comes with an eternal guarantee. That's why it's good news. Have you possessed the good news? Father, we thank you for this reminder of your sacrifice on our behalf. We thank you for the privilege it is to know you, to belong to your family. I pray for anyone here this morning who has never made that commitment of faith, or perhaps they thought they did, but there's nothing in their life that would indicate it. And so they're kind of at a crossroads Am I real? Am I truly, well and truly saved? I pray that you will bring conviction where that's required and that you will not just bring conviction, that, but you will bring faith and that you will bring them to yourself even as we close our service. And I pray also, Father, for all the rest of us who know you. Lord, help us to be proclaimers. Help us to be gospelers. Help us to be in the habit of gospeling others, looking for ways 
to share you. Looking for ways to share you in the way we live. Looking for ways to share you in the words that we say and the way we say them. Looking for ways to demonstrate what Jesus Christ is really like and to communicate what he has done on our behalf. The old message, but heard perhaps in a new way. May we be good and effective proclaimers and preachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Help us now as we sing this closing hymn, Father. May it be, may it be the prayer of our heart as we close our service. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.